All right, I apologize for that. I will probably be drinking some more, so I'm just going to apologize ahead of time. So we are going to be in the book of Mark this morning in chapter 5, but before we kind of get in that a little bit, um, I wanted to just tell you a little bit about <clears throat> some different ways that you can connect more deeply with God. With our youth group, uh, we have Matt who's leading that and he's doing a wonderful job. And I had the uh, privilege of attending as a chaperone and um, helping with, because uh, I, I still teach in there every once in a while. And uh, this youth conference that we went to, it was a Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Okay, And then the way you want to think about it is there's basically two services each day. And they start with worship, and then there'll be a teaching. And then there's a break in the middle, some like breakout sessions and stuff. And then you do the same thing in the evening. You do worship and teaching. So in the course of three days, we have six services. You know, and um, I'm looking at Celeste, she was there too. So anybody who's been there, you kind of know how the routine works. And uh, what's really awesome with that is you're, so I mean, just literally think about that. In three days, you get six services. I mean, that's a lot of church service, right, during that time. But the thing is, it doesn't feel like a service, right? It just feels like um, this is where you want to be. And um, so there's just something awesome about being in a conference or where you dedicate time, kind of like a retreat. You dedicate time to God. Because when you do that, you know, at least for this one, we traveled somewhere. So we weren't at home, we weren't busy with chores or, um, I mean, my kids were there, but they were a little bit well behaved. And um, so we weren't trying to be parenting and all this kind of stuff. We really could focus on what God was doing. And so when you, when you get in a situation like that, uh, it's just natural, you're gonna get closer to God. You're gonna hear a little bit more clearly about what he's doing, right, and what he's saying. And you, you have the opportunity to ask him questions as well. Excuse me. <coughs> And so, you know, obviously I come with a really humble question like, hey, God, I'm doing pretty good. What, what else do you have for me? Like, what do you want me to do? Right? That was kind of my approach to him. And uh, he, he kind of quickly put me in my place and he goes, well, that's not really the question I want you to ask me. You know, this is, this is kind of what I want you to ask is, God, what do you want me to see? What do you want me to do? You know, what, what is it that I need to pay attention to? And uh, because I'm a good speaker, I'm going to leave you hanging. Okay, I'm not going to answer the question. Okay, or at least I'm trying to be a good speaker. Um, so we're going to come back to that in just a minute. But, but really, that's a question I think we want to have in our heart: Is God, what do you want me to see? What is it that you want me to see? Because there's things that God wants you to see, but you have to decide: Are you going to ask that question, or are you going to wait for an answer? Okay. Now, uh, when we look at the the Gospel of Mark. Mark has a unique way of seeing things. Pastor James has done a great job of explaining that. It's kind of a bam, bam. Like, you'll see the word immediately, probably more than any word you'll, you'll see in any, any other um, gospel, and specifically in the, in the gospel of Mark. You'll see immediately a lot because something happens, and then immediately something else happens, and then so it's just a go, go, go kind of a thing. And so just to summarize the last couple, cha couple chapters, in the very uh, first chapter, Jesus was baptized. Um, I remember I told you we got a baptize, baptism coming up on August 4th. So remember, if Jesus did something, you should probably do it too, okay? And then after he got baptized, he was tempted, and then he started to call out some of the first disciples. Uh, and then he does some of his miracles where he casts out an evil spirit. He heals, he heals a paralyzed man. Um, he shows all of his wisdom about fasting and how, you know what the Sabbath is about. And then ultimately he heals on the Sabbath. He calls his 12 disciples. And one thing, too, that you'll notice in the Gospel of Mark is there's a concept of a crowd. There's always these people around Jesus. And um, I don't know that I have a real good understanding of what that meant like, you know, what, what, it, what it was like, what it meant to be in a crowd. Um, but, you know, if I can give you any type of illustration, just think of a mob of people just trying to get to Jesus. You know, if I don't know if anybody here is like an Elvis Presley fan or, you know, maybe he, that's too old. Maybe you're just a Bieber fan or I don't know, you know, I don't know all these guys that are out there. But, um, you know, maybe like David Crowder. I don't know. There could be any of the, you know, maybe the Christian off, you know, uh, guys. But... But there are people that other people want to be around, right? And they create a crowd. And, and as you know, crowd mentality is not always that great. It's more about uh, going crazy, you know, doing what people want to do. Um, so there's just the concept of crowds. And then, uh, you know, Pastor did a great job explaining this too, but when Jesus cast out a demon, uh, he was actually accused by doing it by the power of Satan, uh, which is pretty uh, fascinating when you think about it. And then he, he in, in Mark 4, the previous chapter, he, he talked about parables of the seed sower, of a lamp growing seed, and a mustard seed. And then he performed another miracle, which was to calm the storm, right? He was sleeping in the boat. His disciples are freaking out. And he calms the storm. So that's, it just gives us a little bit of illustration. So that's all the backdrop of what we're doing today, um, coming into chapter 5. <clears throat> 
Now, what I, um, you know, if this gospel was written by the, um, by John, he would probably give us a little bit more visual illustrations, like light and darkness. So I could almost just feel like John saying, "Why don't you say light and darkness when you're talking about this stuff?" But in, you know, in Mark's gospel in in, in chapter five, you're going to see the kingdom of God going against. Satan. And I will tell you, I don't even want to say the kingdom of Satan because I don't think it really is a kingdom, right? When you when you really think of things, you have God, the creator, who's above all, and he created angels, right? And that's what, that's what Satan falls into, is he was an angel, a fallen angel, right? And then when Satan fell, he brought some other angels with him. And those fallen angels are called demons, right? And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So we're seeing this, this battle of light versus darkness, of God's kingdom versus Satan and, and his fallen angels, if you will. Okay. So we literally are talking about spiritual warfare today, and we're going to talk about some of the weapons that we use for spiritual warfare. And, um, and again, this, this is just a little study note, too. If you like to you know, study the Bible and read, you want to pay attention to some of the locations, because things will happen in certain areas, and then certain people will be in those locations, too. And so that can kind of help you kind of frame a mind about what's going on. Um, but that's, you know, that's essentially the, the game there. All right. So I've got too many things here, so I apologize. All right. So let's read some scripture. And uh, I'm going to go through this uh, quickly, but I do want to touch on a couple things. So in chapter 5, we're, we're dealing with uh, someone who's demonized, okay? And um, I guess before I get started, too, you guys may be aware that the crowds were so, I guess, intense and crazy. I think Jesus' health was actually at risk. Like, people were, like, clamoring for him because he was the one that, that brought life and brought healing. So people wanted to be around him. And so one of his ways of escape was to go in a boat and go across the lake to the other side. And that's what we're seeing right here is the, is the first thing in, in verse 1. It says, They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him, out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. So in other words, other word, you know, say demon, uh, demonized. And he lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles into pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. In verse 5, And night and day among the tombs and on the mountains he was always crying and cutting himself with stones. <clears throat> okay, so you guys get this picture. This guy doesn't have a lot of hope. right? He's, he's demon-possessed, if you will, demonized. And nobody wants to be around him. Now, uh, you know, when we look at this, you know, he, he literally could not be bound. They, they tried to tie him up, right? They tried to put chains on him, but it was just too strong. You know, and what, what we don't get here in the scripture is how does someone become demonized? And, I, I, you know, again, I'm not here to give you all the answers, but, um, you know, that doesn't sound like a good process, right? Who wants to be demonized or demon-possessed? And, you know, when it comes to the scripture, it comes, to, you know, we get some guidance, but a lot of it is when we decide that we're going to we're going to kind of obey sin, and we're going to allow sin to rule in our lives. We kind of open the door to allow, you know, dark things in. Now, in this particular one, I, I would say most likely this guy was never a Christian in the first place, right? He didn't know God, right? And so, to me, that leaves the possibility that someone could be demonized in that way. And then sometimes, you know, people can curse people. I mean, I, I mean, there's the concept of blessings, and there's the concept of curses. And um, what I want to do is, is be real careful about this, because, and, and I'm going to get to it in a minute, I am not trying to elevate darkness at this point. You know, I'm just trying to say darkness is on the map. That's really all I'm trying to do. Um, but really, to get free from demons, I mean, we're going to talk about this in, in a minute, God's the one that has the, the ability to do that. God's the one that can set people free. And if we are purposely sinning, like we know what we're, we're not supposed to do, then we need to stop doing that, right? We need to follow what God has asked us to do. We need to close that door, okay? But what I think is interesting here is, <coughs> so there's, there's this guy who's bound with a demon, and they're trying to chain him down, right? They're trying to lock him up. They're, in my opinion, they're trying to fix a spiritual problem with a natural solution, right? They're trying to, they're using the wrong weapons is kind of what I'm getting at. Like there's a problem and they're not, they're not attacking it spiritually. They're just like, well, can we subdue it? Can we make the symptoms less? Can we just make it to where we're all comfortable getting by, right? Uh, when there's another approach, there's another weapon that can be used. And the reality is when you take, when you have a spiritual problem and you take a natural solution to it, the spiritual is always going to win, right? I mean, the, the demon has total power over that. There's, the natural has no power. 
again, God comes into the mix here. <laughs> now, I just want to give you an example. So recently, we um, I was sharing with some of the guys. Uh, I'm sure nobody in here has been in a car accident, right? So you guys can't relate to this, okay? But so we have a situation where we're in a car accident, and as far as you know, we're concerned, we're innocent, right? Like we're the, you know. So I mean, I am a Christian. I am trying to tell the truth here, but I'm pretty sure we were not at fault, okay? And and then, and then the interesting thing is with the other party is they kind of verbally said, oh yeah, you know, we're at fault too, and and all that, but. You know, lo and behold, it goes all the way through the insurance process, and guess what? Their insurance says uh, they're not at fault, right? You know, so, I mean, surprise, surprise, right? That's just kind of how the game is played, is, um, you know, it's just based on whatever rules are in place and all that kind of stuff. So, naturally, my mind would go to what? How do I, yeah, so we go to my insurance and all this kind of stuff, and they're like, okay, well, we have to investigate. But, I mean, in, in my heart, I, I want it to be right, right? I want the truth to be revealed. I want to, I mean, you know, I'm doing everything right, aren't I? I mean, I'm paying for my insurance. We're driving safely. Someone hits us. But, yeah, we're still considered... Uh, I guess we, we could even possibly be guilty, right? We could be... So uh, the whole moral of the story is, we're, as far as we know, we're doing everything that we can correctly, but yet we're getting penalized for that, right? We're, we're not getting the, the benefits of the system for, for being honest, right? And all this kind of thing. And of course, it hasn't played out yet. It's still going to go through, but... But at this point, it basically is going to be going to a court case, most likely, where it's a he said, she said kind of a thing, right? And if I'm that judge, how do I make that determination, right? The judge was not there. The judge, maybe because he's some pictures, but he hears this story, hears that story, and that's it. And so someone somewhere is going to make a determination on this case, but... And honestly, so I'm trying to figure out how can we how can we win the case, and then finally I, it just clicks in my mind. Oh, okay, you know this is nobody got hurt, right? It's just about a car. It's just about a little bit of money, and so I have to come back to God. And, and I'm not I'm trying to f to fight a spiritual battle with natural means, right? I'm trying to figure it out. I'm trying to do it on my own, and I'm excluding God. And that's a whole illustration of that story. Is that at some point I go, okay, God, you know what? I'm not going to figure this out. I'm not going to prove anybody innocent or guilty. I'm going to let you go ahead and do that. I'm going to let your justice be okay. Because in the end, if I pay more for my car, okay, that's fine. But what's what's more important is we bring God into the picture, okay? And we can pray and bless for that other the, the other party as well, right? This doesn't have to be the the wedge that splits us, right? That now this is my mortal enemy because of you know some injustice that was done. Okay, so that's that's just my admonishment to you is every day I think we're faced with things like this where we have problems, we have situations, and we can decide, are we going to fight these spiritual problems with natural solutions, or are we going to actually invite God into it? Okay, now uh, I mentioned a little bit about just how demons can, I guess, come in and, and have you know have access to us. Now remember, a demon is a fallen angel, so they know who God is. They know what they're capable of. They know what they're supposed to do, uh, yet they choose to follow um, Satan and, and, and his thing. Now, uh, there's some really bright people, and you probably have heard of C.S. Lewis, but he says one thing when it comes to spiritual warfare and when it comes to demons, uh, we have to be real careful because there's two, he says there are two equal and opposite errors in which our race, you know, the human race, can fall about the devils. One is to totally disbelieve their existence. Okay, so if we don't believe in, in the devil and demons, that's, that's a big problem. Okay, so again, I'm just trying to help you guys. Don't do that. That's a mistake. And on the other end, uh, the other is to believe and feel an excessive unhealthy interest in them. Okay, the darkness is never meant to be the focus. The darkness is there. It has its place, but it's, it's never meant to be the focus. And um, there's another uh, wonderful Christian out there named Jack Hayford, and he talks about, you know, when you deal with a problem, uh, or you're dealing with a situation, you have to realize what you're dealing with. Because sometimes people will do things just because they don't know. It's like, it's kind of like ignorance. They just don't know what they're supposed to do. So you're supposed to disciple them, right? You're supposed to help them and guide them and learn. And, and hopefully that's what's happening today is you're being discipled a little bit. Uh, but then there are other people like this guy who is chained up and, and bound and demon-possessed. Well, he literally has an influence on him that he cannot control, right? He needs, he needs the, the demon needs to be cast out. So what Jack Hayford says is, so I'm going to say this the right way, and I'll say it the way that Jack Hayford says it so it's a little bit clearer. Um, so what Jack Hayford is saying is you have to disciple the flesh, and you have to cast out demons. And so to say the opposite, he says you can't disciple a demon, 
and you can't cast out the flesh, okay? So basically, uh, you don't want to focus on, um, you, you just want to make sure you're dealing with the right thing. But here's what I, um, here, here's what I want to leave you with, and I, I think this is probably the most p powerful sp principle I've ever learned on spiritual warfare, is, okay, the darkness is there, and that's fine. That's, that's the demons and the fallen angels. But God's love is there, right? And God's presence is there. And there's nothing better than God's presence. His light is something that when darkness is, is there, it gets exposed, it gets revealed. It doesn't have any power. So, and that's kind of what we were praying for this morning is, you know, the best thing that we can do is bring God's presence with us. Because uh, as we're going to see here, when darkness is around, it can't hide. It has to come face to face with God, and it has to subject itself to to God, right? So light, uh, lightness, God's presence. There is no, there's, there's nothing that darkness can do in that sense. And so for us, that's our, that's what I want to admonish you with, is to bring God's presence with you, and bring as much of God's presence with you as you can. All right. So let's continue reading in verse six. And it says, when he saw Jesus, this is the man who was demon-possessed, from afar he ran and fell down before him. And crying with a loud voice, he said, what have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. Now, I just want to notice here, too, that the, the, the demon ran towards God, right? The demon-possessed guy ran towards God. It just, there's this authority, there's this power that comes from, from Jesus that cannot be resisted. And he confesses himself in you know, verse 7. What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? And if you haven't caught this yet, when we're reading through the Gospel of Mark, every time that Jesus is confessed as the Son of God, it's typically a demon that's doing it. Jesus himself isn't saying it. The, the, even the disciples, the people around him aren't saying it. But it's the demons. So the demons know what's up. And we need to know what's up as well. Now... You know, this is something God put on my heart, and this, I, I'm not sure if I can even prove this to you biblically, so I'm going to just give you this as my opinion. But I, in my heart, I, I just think about that man who's demon-possessed, and that he sees Jesus from afar. I just, in my heart, I, I just want to say that he himself, even being demon-possessed, ran towards God. Like he wanted to, like he saw God and he wanted to be there. Okay, and again, I'm just giving you this as my opinion, because I'm not sure that I can really... Um, you know, back it up, but I want you to consider that. Because if that's true, if, if it really is that man that's going towards God, like, not even a demon can keep you from God, right? And there's scripture that says nothing can separate us from the love of God. So I, I really, really, really want us to believe that and, and see that, but um, but I'm going to leave that to you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to make you, just, just consider it is all I'm saying. But, you know, if, if that's true, if, if there really is nothing that can keep us from the love of God, then that means nothing. That means not your past. That means not your family, not your friends. That means not anybody who's hurt you. It's not even the mistakes that you've made. It's not even cancer. Nothing can keep you from the love of God. And so I just want, that's a very powerful principle. I want you to grasp that. Now, we've already said that the, the demon has confessed that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, in, in verse 9, in so Jesus, uh, well, actually, verse 8 is important, so I'm going I'm to read it. It says, for he was saying, this is Jesus, was saying to him, the demon-possessed man, come out of the man, you unclean spirit. So Jesus is, is commanding, he's being authoritative. And in verse 9, Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Um, and again, this is something too, just, just a little bit of food for thought, but when I think about our God, I think about Jesus, and I think about who he cares about, and he's asking that guy, what is your name? Do you think he wanted to know the demon's name? I mean, I think there's power in that. When you know a demon's name, it, it kind of sets the stage to cast him out. I'm, I'm totally good with that. I'm totally fine. But when I just think about the heart of our God, when he's asking about the name, and he's addressing that guy, is he addressing that person, or is he addressing that, the man inside? You know? And again, I'm not, I'm not asking you to think one way or the other, but I, in my heart, I want to say he's, ask, he's asking about the man inside, right? He cares about him. Um, but unfortunately, again, he's totally out of control, right? The demon is in control, so the demon is the one that is speaking. But just in my heart, I just, I just feel like God, he's asking about that person, the one that's inside. And again, if it's true, that, that man himself, even being demon-possessed, came towards God, uh, which I just, I just think is very powerful. I just think it's very powerful. 
Now, uh, we again, we're going to see a little bit of the struggle of light versus dark, or of, of God's kingdom versus Satan. And so in, in verse 12, it says, They, which is the demons inside of the man, they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So you really want to get this too when it comes to spiritual warfare. Uh, the demons don't tell God what to do. They kind of ask, right? They don't say, okay, God, you're going to do this. Or, you know, we're going to fight and, and the demons are going to win. That's not, that's not in the picture at all. Okay. So remember, God is above and the demons are below. And so they have to submit and they can, they can only negotiate. They can't really, uh, they can't command, they can't do anything. And in verse 13, it says, so he gave them permission. So Jesus cast out the demons. So that's one thing we need to realize is that's one of the powers that Jesus can do. That's one of his capabilities. Jesus can cast out demons. And that has to be a part of our faith. Right, is that Jesus has authority over the spiritual realm. We already saw in Mark 4 that he has, a, he has authority over nature, where he can, he can calm the storm. Now he's showing us that he has authority over the spiritual realm. Okay, we're going to jump down to verse 15, and it says, uh, so just to, I, I guess I need to paraphrase a little bit. So Jesus does send them out to the pigs, and just picture a hill, all the pigs are on a hill, and then they just all run down into the water and drown. Okay, pretty sad scene for all you animal lovers. I'm sorry about that, but that happened, okay? Um, and it was, it was actually a big deal for everyone around there. And it's, it's in, in verse 15, it says, And they came to Jesus, and they saw the demon-possessed man. These are the people in the city. The one who had the legion sitting there clothed in his right mind, and they were afraid. So the people who knew that this demon-possessed man was there, they... They saw how he was. They knew who he was before, but now they see him. He's now been healed, right? He's now been healed. I'm going to take a little water break here. Are you okay? <laughs> uh, we're getting a secondary commentary. Better preaching, you know. Thank you. I, I am not one to stop God's word, so I'm going to let it go, Okay. <laughs> Okay, but so uh, one little point I just want to touch on too. So Jesus set the man free, right? He gave permission for those demons to go. Now, remember, whatever Jesus did, whatever he said, we have the potential to do as well, right? And so we want to think about this like, uh, do we actually have the ability to set people free? Is that something that we can do? Now, I'm not here to admonish you to, to go find demons and, and fight them. That's not what I'm trying to do here, okay? But I will say that there might be a possibility that you will see some, you know, and you'll be in a spot where there are people who are, who are bound and in bondage, and you may be the person that God's going to use to help them get set free. And here's, here's the way that you're going to do it, and we're going to talk about it a little bit more. Uh, it's not going to be anything special that you say. It's not going to be things that you know. It's going to be that because you've been, you spent time with God and you've allowed God to be with you, that you're going to, be, you're going to bring God's presence and his authority, and then you're going to tell darkness where it needs to go. Right? And, what I, and if you have uh, you know, interest in that, I'd love for you to talk to the church. You can you know, ask Pastor James, ask me, ask any of the leaders here. Um, but again, we, you know, it's not something to be afraid of. But much like we said in that quote before, we don't want that to be our focus, right? Like C.S. Lewis, we're not going to just, okay, now we're going to spend 100% of our time on demons. That's not going to get us anywhere. We don't want to do that. Okay, but just know that that's part of the plan. That's part of the picture. But there are people in your lives that may need to be, that are bound, may need to be set free. Okay? So you want to be, you want to keep an eye open for that. Remember, we're asking God, what is it that you want me to see? Okay, now, um, we're back on verse 15. Remember, the demon-possessed the demon possessed man is there. The pigs are in the water. They're gone. And the guy that was demon-possessed is in his right mind, and they were all afraid. So the people of the town who saw this crazy guy who was demonized, who could not be bound, rip, you know, he was cutting himself with rocks. He was ripping his chains off. Now that he's sitting here like a normal person, now they're scared. They were okay when things were however they were before, however they expected them to be. But now that he's been set free, now they're afraid. Does that seem strange to you? Why would they be afraid? Now, again, I, it's hard for us to put ourselves in their shoes, but things will be totally different. Like, something happened to that guy. What is going on? I mean, if you're like me, you might be skeptical. Like, oh, he's just faking it, right? Like, in, in any minute, he's going to go crazy. But it says that he was clothed, because I, I might have made a, uh, missed a little detail there, but he was actually not clothed before. So, uh, you know, when he was chained and bound up. <clears throat> so they see a total difference, a total transformation in him. 
and they were afraid. You know, and, and to me, I am confused about that, but, you know, there's some things that go on, you know, that maybe we don't understand, but those pigs, I said it was about 200,000, or not 200,000, 2,000, but in terms of monetary value, it could have been around $250,000 worth of stuff, okay? Now, I know our houses are kind of expensive, you know, so they're probably more than that, but, like, if, if literally we lost our house value, that would probably upset us a little bit, right? We'd probably like, hey, that's that's not cool. I don't, I don't want to lose that kind of money. Um, so, you know, things... Things that we that bring us comfort, things that are valuable, things that we lose in the name of God, that can cause us to be afraid. And you know, so property unfortunately can be put above God, and that maybe is what's going on. Um, but you know, when God moves and when God does stuff, people aren't always okay with that. They don't they don't like their lives being changed. They don't like having to exchange the way that they used to do things with the way that God wants them to do things, right? And um, and and it, and it literally has cost them something. You know, those the, the pigs unfortunately didn't didn't um, survive, if you will. Now, in verse seventeen, we got to catch this, and it says, "And then the people, and they be, they beg, they begged Jesus to depart from their region." Not only did he do a miracle and do something awesome, like saving this this, this lost man, and they're like, "Okay, thank you for coming, but now you can leave." The door is open, and please go now. There's no need for you to be here. Okay? So they, they are actively chasing Jesus out of the area. Now, the guy that was healed, he realized he's not welcome there either. He's like, well, if Jesus is going, I'm going to go with Jesus too, right? And that's a pretty good place to be. Wherever Jesus is going, that's where I want to go. But Jesus had a different plan for him. And in verse 19, it says, and he, which is Jesus, did not permit him, the guy who was healed from the, or freed from the demon. But he said to him, he had a task for him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he obeyed and he did what he, um, what he asked him to do. So can you guys say testimony, right? That's kind of what he's saying. He's saying testimony, right? He's saying, okay, I did something for you. People around you need to know about it. And so please go do that. Now for me, what's, what th one thing that's interesting is whenever you see Jesus doing a miracle, especially, or something like this in the book of Mark, he's always saying, uh, zip it, don't tell anybody, keep it a secret, maybe go show the priest or something. But in this particular case, he actually told the guy to go and, and tell people about it. So does that seem strange to you, that he would have a different approach for this guy? And, um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I could tell you exactly why he did that, but the area that he was in was considered to be more Gentile area, which would mean there'd be less Jewish people and there'd be less, um, you know, uh, Jew Jewish church leaders mad at him <laughs> and causing a riot and trying to throw him in jail. So there could have been some political stuff going on, I'm not sure. But I do think testimony is very powerful, right? As we know in, in the book of Revelations, we overcome um, the enemy, right, by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And that's an example of that. Okay, now, um, remember I gave you guys a question. I asked God, what is it that you want me to see? I don't know if you guys remember that. It was a long time ago. It was probably like 10 minutes ago, okay? Now, and I was asking God, what do you want me to see? And I'm going to tell you what I felt like God was telling me because maybe he's telling you this, but I know he's not telling all of you this, but he's telling, maybe he's telling you some of this. But I felt like God was saying, where you're at, Russell, that's exactly where I want you to be. So I thought I need to be over there. I need to be doing something different. I need to be, you know, whatever it is that I, I had thoughts. He said, no, I have you exactly where I want you. Okay? So maybe today God is telling some of you guys, I have you exactly where I want you. Okay? Maybe, maybe he's answering you a different, uh, different way. But, and, and for me, I felt like he was saying, you need to grow where you're planted. I have you there for a reason. You need to grow deeper. And I have put things in front of you that you need to do. And if I have to be honest, there are things that I have not been doing yet. <laughs> and I need to do those things. Okay? And I know what they are. And so I just, if you ask God what those things are, um, I trust that he would show you those too. And one last thing I want to share with you, and I'm probably going to say this wrong, but I'm just going to say it. Um, when I was in worship during that youth conference, I felt like God was kind of showing me a little bit of my pride and that I need to be a little bit more humble. And so uh, this is how it played out for me, is that in some cases, I f well, actually in a lot of cases, I really feel, um, I guess, how's the way to say this? When people say they appreciate the way you minister or what you say, or, or maybe they're just being nice, just to say kind words, it, it really is, uh, it brings life, right? It's something that you hunger for, or you, you desire. And, and so this is what I felt like I had to tell God is, I don't want your glory. 
okay? And then I just want to clarify that because when I say I don't want your glory, you could, you could probably hear it the way that you're supposed to hear it, which is not the way I mean it. <laughs> so you know when you say something, but it's not what you mean? So God's glory is awesome. His presence is important, and I, we need his presence. So I do want that glory, okay? So I, want, I just want you guys to be clear about that. I want God's glory where his presence is here. But what I don't want is glory that's directed towards him that goes towards me. Okay, and another way to say that is, you know, sometimes people glorify other people. You know, the glory of man is what we seek sometimes. Like what other people say and what other they do for us when that glory really should be going to God. Okay? And so, again, if you are serious about asking God that question, what do you want me to see? He will answer it. And, and at some point I said, okay, God, stop showing me stuff because this is enough. <laughs> right? Okay? So you, get, you guys decide how much you want to take in. But, uh, you know, the more that you sit and ask him, he will show you. And you'll realize, oh, man, I'm not as great of a Christian as I thought I was. <laughs> right? And, uh, and that's okay because... He's continuing to work in us, right? He has a plan in, for for each one of us, and he knows he knows what we're make we're we're made to be, but we have to choose if we're going to go that route, that route or not. All right, let's jump back. Okay, so we just saw a miracle of Jesus healing a demon possessed man. So he set people free. So he has power and authority over the spiritual realm. Okay, so that brings us down to verse twenty one, and uh, I'm going to read twenty two. Okay, so um, just in 21, all it's saying is, guess what? There's a crowd again, because he just, he just you know, set this man free, this demon-possessed man free, and now he's going across the, boat, the, the ocean again, okay, because he's escaping the crowd. That's the only way he can kind of get things done. Otherwise, he's going to get swallowed up by the crowd. So in verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, um, Jairus, if I'm saying that right, by name, and seeing him, and Jairus fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. Okay? So his reputation has gone before him. People know that he is the, the kind of person that if you're desperate, he is going to be able to, to fix things for you. And, um, and I think that kind of explains the, explains the crowds a little bit because, I mean, honestly, if you were not feeling well or you knew somebody that wasn't feeling well and there's somebody coming around that's healing people and they're not charging anything, right? You're going to go like, hey, free healing? I'm going to go there, right? I'm going to go bring, all I got to do is bring people there. And so that's what all these people are doing. And, and this one uh, gentleman, Jairus, He's on board and he's doing that. And, uh, and we see in, you know, in verse 24, uh, and it says, And he went with him, and a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And this is where I just love to give you a good visual. But I can only just think of like Jesus in the, in the center of this crowd and just this mob of people, like a swarm of bees, just all just trying to get near him. And I, I, just, I just picture mass chaos and probably stinky people who are sweating and they haven't showered in a long time. You know, it's just, it's probably not a good, a good scene. There's dust being kick up, kicked up and just uh, a, a mass of people. And in verse, um, excuse me. And so th this is one thing that's kind of funny. So there's kind of a, a sandwich, if you will. There's, a, there's another event that's going on. So Because he's on his way to heal this, this daughter. He's going he's gonna to bring her back to life, or at least that's what he's planning to do. And then something happens along the way. And so let's look, look at, uh, I'm going to jump down to verse 25. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and she was no better but grew worse. So remember, we're kind of dealing in here with like a, a natural problem she's got a, a natural healing you know body issue and just go to the doctors right that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but they're not helping her right not only that is she, she's spending all her money she's not getting fixed right and it, and it says she's actually getting worse you know are there sometimes we have problems in our lives where we just for some reason forget to include god in them like we just try to figure it out on our own so we got to be careful about that because you know, it's, it's just not going to work if we don't put God in the picture. Okay? So let's go to verse, we're going to jump down to verse 27. And she had heard the reports, again, Jesus' reputation is before him, and he came up, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garments. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I'll be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. So she knew she just had to go and be around God and to touch him to be healed, okay? And that's something I think we need, to, we need to take on with us too. We need to be around God and we can just touch him, we can be healed. 
And that's one of the things that's awesome about our healing rooms is I think it encourages those kind of things. You know, when I think about all these healings, like earlier, setting free, Jesus just spoke and he gave permission, and the demon man was possessed. And in this case, the woman came and just touched his clothes, right? So Jesus isn't about this pattern, like just do A, B, C, and you're done, you're healed, right? He's very creative. He does things in a lot of different ways. And, you know, I'm just, I'm just thinking about Jesus, what did he do to heal her? Like, did he even look at her? Did he say any words to her? Did he even recognize her? You know, any of those things? I just, I just think in this particular case, much like we prayed this morning, Jesus spent time with God, and he knew to get enough of God's presence for somebody else. And he just literally had to walk by and someone had to touch him for that healing power to come out of him. So in verse, in verse 30, And Jesus perceived that in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? Now I have to admit, I, to me, I kind of feel like that's a little bit of a joke there. Okay? I mean, there's some seriousness to it, but I mean, literally, there's 100 people <laughs> around him, and he says, Who touched me? And the disciples are like, Are you serious? Look at all these people around me, around you. How would we even know? Like, everybody's touching you. Like, I don't think anybody is not touching you. <laughs> that might be the better question. Like, who's not touching you? <laughs> right? We can probably narrow it down that way. Uh, but Jesus wants to know who touched him and who got healed. And so, jumping down to verse 33. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I do want to read her, her response to that. Uh, yeah, it actually is in verse 33. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in um, with fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he, and he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. Okay. So when it comes to healing, God's presence is the, the main ingredient, if you will. We need God to do things. But you know, faith plays a variable in there too. Okay. It might be very small, very teeny, but in this case, it seemed like it's pretty significant. Her faith had made her well, and Jesus made a point to tell him about that. Okay, do you guys remember he was, Jesus was on a, a journey somewhere? He just he healed the demon-possessed man. Now this woman just got healed of her issue of blood. But she was, he was on his way somewhere, right? He was going to heal this, this man's daughter. And so we're going to come back to that um, as we come through. But, you know, when I think about that, do you think sometimes that God will give us a direction and he will maybe throw some other things in there that we need to do? Right? And, and all I'm trying to say is, if God's asking you to do something, maybe he's asking you to do worship, or he's asking you to teach kids, or he's asking you to do something. Um, but there might be other people along the way that you need to minister to that are just as important as that original direction. Okay? And so all I'm doing is I'm encouraging you to keep your eyes open to see what it is that God's asking you to do. And, um, and remember, we want to con we want to continue to ask him for guidance. We want to just you know say, okay, I got my path, and not listen to him anymore. Um, now as we go, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but uh, Jesus finds out that the girl has passed away. So this whole time that he's been on this journey and, and this woman was healed, the little girl has passed away. So as you might expect, sadness uh, has now come into the family, right? It's starting to set the scene. And so much so as we, as we'll see here in a little bit, um, they're the process of losing somebody of mourning is very important and i and i'm in some ways i'm jealous of some other cultures because i feel like at least me or our culture doesn't grieve very well uh, but it's very important for them and so they actually have a concept of professional mourners who would be you know crying and um and helping the family to grieve and and process the death that's going on and so now hope is kind of lost now right because the daughter was alive but now she's now she's dead and Jesus, when he heard of it, in verse 36, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, he said, do not fear, only believe. Because, you know, our circumstances can change how we feel. They can change how we think. They can kind of disrupt our faith. But Jesus is back there to correct us and align us back to him and say, look, it, 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 it almost doesn't matter what you see on the physical side. He has the ability on the spiritual side to make things different. So do not fear, only believe. Our faith has to be above our circumstances. And then he has this select group, which you may have seen this before. He brings in Peter, James, and, and John, and they're the ones that are going to be with him to experience this event that's about to happen. And remember, I was just saying that they, they are already starting to grieve the loss of the daughter because she's precious, right? Everyone loves their children. And, and, and they're crying and they're wailing. 
And then Jesus comes in verse 39 and he says, why are you guys making a commotion and weeping? This child is not dead but sleeping. And in verse 40 they, it says they laughed at him. They laughed at him because like, what are you talking about, Jesus? She's dead. You don't even understand what you're saying. And I, I want you to catch this. In verse 40 he says, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. You know, there are some times where um, there'll be naysayers. There'll be people who doubt. There'll be people who don't really want to see a miracle. They won't really be part of the solution and they need to be put aside. So there is, there is a, a time and a place where uh, doubt needs to be removed and those who love and care will be part of, you know, uh, seeing God's miracle and they'll be part of, of bringing life back. So in verse 41, Jesus says, taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha Kumi, if I'm saying that correctly, that's Aramaic, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And, Im and immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age, and they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he charged that no one should know about this. Remember, I told you, he doesn't like to people to spread the miracles because of where he is, I think, in this case. Okay, so now Jesus has just demonstrated his power over death, right? So we've just seen that he can cast out the, the spirits, he can heal a health issue, and he has power over death. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end here. What are we... What are, we, what are we to take of all of this stuff? Well, what I'm hoping is that we realize just the power and authority that Jesus has. This is the God that we believe in, can do all of these things. And he's also said that we have the ability to do them as well. Okay, so this is where we, there's a, there's a handing off, there's a baton, and this is a big act of faith that we would believe what Jesus said. Like we, we've read about what he's, we just talked about what he's done, but do we really believe that we can do these things? Because Jesus sets people free, he brings life, and he brings healing. Now again, I would, I would propose to you that the majority of what Jesus can do is because he spent time alone with God to be intimate with him, to receive his presence, and not only just for himself, but for those around him. Okay, and, and if this helps at all, this might be a silly example, but I know it's vacation time, and when you go on vacation, you bring a bag. Right? And generally that bag's for you. <laughs> but if you've got other people, each one has their own bag. And just, just think of it like this. You can go with God's presence, with everybody's bags filled, but you're carrying them all, and that's all God's presence. And all I'm trying to say is there is much more of God that we have access to that, than we may be experiencing. Okay? And that when we come around people, they can just grab one of those bags, and God can bless them and touch them. Right? God can move through us just because we spent time with God. And so to me, that's what I, I think I want to leave you with, is how is your time with God? Are we thinking of God that way? Where it's not just about us getting from week to week, but it's about us being completely filled and filling up other people. Okay, it's about taking ground in God's kingdom. It's not just about surviving. It's about being effective and being victorious like he was and is. <laughs> So you, in addition to just spending time with God, which, again, we're doing it right now, this, this morning. Uh, you can do it on your own. Um, but there's just some things you, you, you have to be aware of. And, and if you've been a Christian a while, you'll know this in Romans 10, 9. Until you really accept God into your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Son of God, you're going to be stuck at kind of the entry gate. You're not going to be going very far. And so we, we have to choose to, to believe that Jesus is the Son of God and take in his, just the fullness. And, and as we talked about earlier about baptism, when you read the Gospels carefully, remember we just saw that Jesus was baptized himself. And when Jesus was baptized, the Holy Spirit came in his fullness into Jesus. And we need that as well. And from that point on, Jesus was tempted, but then you see these wonderful miracles that we've been talking about. And Jesus himself separated from the crowds. He separated and spent time with God alone. And that's something that we have to do as well. And ultimately, we have to put on the full armor of God. We cannot fight spiritual things with natural means. We have to put on our spiritual armor so that we can fight the way that God has called us to fight. And in Matthew 10, 8, it says that they we're commanded to, at least the disciples, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, to cleanse the lepers, and, lepers, excuse me, and to drive out demons. 
So you, see, you hear that? Heal the sick, raise the dead, drive out demons. Didn't we just talk about that right now in Mark 5? <laughs> so that's basically a one-line scripture summarizing what Mark 5 was. We didn't have lepers in there, so that's a little extra. But it says, freely you have received, freely give. All right, what I would like to do is I want to go ahead and close our service. I'm going to ask you guys to bow your heads and I want to pray over you. And if you'd like, I want to, I'm going to go ahead and open up the altar too if you want to get some prayer. I would really encourage that. Lord, there's just so much to you and your word and your Holy Spirit, Lord, that we need to encounter and we, we need to live in the fullness of. And so, Lord, I just, I pray for the... For each one of us, Lord, that we would see just how clear you make things in your word and just the simplicity of your love towards us. Uh, Lord, you truly do have power over the spiritual realm and authority and over natural and healing and, and bringing people back to life and, and just over nature and calming the storm. And so I pray you would release in us this hunger and this understanding and this passion to be filled completely with you, to overflowing, and Lord, that we would get everything from you, Lord, that we need, but that those around us need as well. So Lord, let us go through each day knowing that there are people that we are supposed to look for to set free. There are people that need to be healed just because we're around them and we, we spend time with you, they get healed. And Lord, there are people that we need to bring life as well. Jesus, you weren't the only one that brought people back from the dead, and it's because the Holy Spirit through you is what did it. So Lord, I pray that we would all bring your presence wherever we go. We would have a renewed focus on you. And Lord, we just that we, 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 hand, we hand over our excuses to you. We exchange our excuses for your holiness. And if we don't understand, we ask questions that we come to you, Lord. I pray for open hearts. And I pray for um, just for us to fill the, de the destiny, excuse me, that you have called us to. So in every way that we can, Lord, we submit to you and we honor you and we love you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, I'd like to invite the altar ministry team. If you can come up, please. And if you, uh, I would love for you guys to get some prayer today. And please do be praying for our Guatemala team. Uh, they have a whole nother week that they're going to go through. And we have our guest speaker next week. So please come get some prayer. And God bless you. God be with you.